And hello, and welcome to the Ben Like Bamboo vlog, sessions designed to maximize resilience and your health. So I believe that flexibility builds resilience. And we are in a time where we are globally faced with so much change. And I wanted to have a conversation all about how to maximize resilience with flexibility so we can all get through the, um, the change that we're all going through, all the changes in life and every day we experience change, but then sometimes life brings big change. And um, this is when we're, where we find our resilience to be the most important. Um, and we all have resilience and we have a very special guest on today who is super resilient. Um, and I'm very proud to have her on um, the Ben Like Bamboo vlog today. And, um, when we are more flexible and we can adapt to change, we are more open to change. We're more adaptable. We're more innovative and creative. We can find solutions. We can rise above the turbulence and we can see our obstacles as opportunities. And that's exactly what Nicole has been able to do in her life. Um, so introducing my twin sister, Nicole Campbell. Welcome. Thank you. And Nicole is a very talented tattoo artist. She specializes in eyebrows. And yes, I've had my eyebrows done. And of course, Nicole has beautiful eyebrows. And so Nicole um, has always been in the beauty industry. And then she was also a makeup artist. And then um, now she's a tattoo artist and she specializes in um, cosmetic tattooing. And she's got a business called um, Mien Brows. <laughs> you almost said been like bamboo, didn't you? <laughs> I did. I reckon I did. Yeah. That's so weird that it's just like a regurgitation. Um, see how you always know what I'm thinking. I didn't even know I was thinking that until you knew. You were, it was, yeah. And it was so funny because we did another yeah. version of this earlier today, but it didn't work because my old computer wasn't working. So take two. Take and two. everything you said about your childhood was exactly word for word how I was writing it in my book today in that chapter. It was so weird. I've got to show you that later. Oh, wow. And so, so yeah, welcome to the show, Nicole, and thanks, thanks for being my first guest on the blog or the vlog. The vlog. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I want to first ask you, um, actually, before I ask you, I want to explain, I want to set the scene. Um, mm -hmm. Both Nicole and I have autoimmune diseases. I've got multiple sclerosis and I was diagnosed at 24, but Nicole was diagnosed with Crohn's disease when we were 11. And Nicole mm -hmm. had one of the worst cases ever seen. She was really sick with Crohn's and um, I'll let Nicole explain what Crohn's is all about and everything that she went through. Let's start with that, Nicole. What's Crohn's? Okay. So Crohn's disease is an autoimmune disease where your immune system, like any autoimmune disease, thinks that there's a bug, for example, for me in my large bowel, small bowel and stomach that isn't there. Therefore, the immune system, um, rather than attacking a foreign matter that isn't there, it attacks my large bowel, small bowel, stomach, and then eventually all my joints in my body. So yeah, that's basically, so the symptoms are fatigue, um, weight loss, um, bleeding from the bowel, and um, I had a rare form of arthritis where the inflammation from my stomach and bowel spread to every joint in my body. And I was very malnourished, got up to nine, got down to 19 kilos. Yeah. Um, yeah. But Crohn's is a very individual disease as is MS. So that was for me. Um, um, yeah. Lots of bleeding from the bowel, lots of bowel cramps. Um, intense stomach pain and, of course, body pain. What about emotionally and cognitively? Emotionally and cognitively, um, very fatigued, very tired. Because um, you don't have the nutrients there, you don't, your brain doesn't function as well. So you, you get very, um, learning is harder. For example, when we were at school and I was starting to get really tired from, remember grade six, um, we weren't in the same class then, but in grade six, um, that's when I you started, started to not come to school. Start, no, no, I was still at school then. It was year seven that that okay. happened, but grade six, I remember having to go to bed as soon as we got home from school Yeah, and just really tired. So extreme fatigue, therefore emotionally more anxious. Um, yeah. and, um, yeah, just really very flat. Yeah. Yeah, so me mentally, emotionally, and physically, it's a very debilitating disease. Um, yeah, so you were diagnosed with it when we were so young. 
Mm. And so I remember that was really difficult watching you go through that because we are twins and we did yeah. everything together, particularly when we were younger, all the photos mm. of us when we were kids, we were holding hands, we were best friends. We did everything together and you went through so much, not only just with your illness, but then that isolation from school and your friends and me and, and we weren't doing everything together anymore. And, and I yeah. really felt the trauma of that too, because I had mm. no choice but to go to school and I was too yeah. young to be able to sit next to you all the time, even though I wanted to. And I, so I was forced to make friends and sort of like keep living life, even though I didn't want to. And that created um, a massive abandonment issues for both of us it that did. we're probably still working through now that we're, even though we're 40 now, we still, yeah. still work through that, don't we? We do. We do. Yeah, it is. Um, it was very traumatic on both of us. Like we were separated when we were born for six yeah, weeks. Yeah, so we were six weeks prem and they put us mm. in separate humini cribs because back right. then they didn't realise. They didn't know. That, yeah, they didn't realise that may and not be grade, such a good idea. Grade four was our second separation where we um, were split up. They thought it was unhealthy for us to be in the same class. Same class. I know, and I disagree. I think we thrived when we were together. and it You we, did. Oh, no, yeah, when, we we together, we together, when we were together, when we were together. You did then... quite well, though. You were really, you're more of an extrovert, I'm more of an introvert. And you did quite well, even though it was hard. I, I was remembering that being really you found it harder. Well. You, you found yeah, it harder to be a part. I did, yeah. I did. And then um, our third separation, I guess, was boyfriends and stuff and you moving out. No, oh, yeah. no the third in my early 20s. So, yeah, third separation was our, my illness. Fourth separation was like, you moving out of home first, which was so weird. Yeah. And then the fifth thing, yeah, was your disease, but it actually brought us back together. Back together. And everything that we'd learned in my disease, I was there for you as an adult. It was, you know. Yeah, it's like the tables turned. So I, yeah. I was, you know, after school, I would come to your hospital bed and I would sit next to you and, and I would be there as much as I could. But I really wasn't there in the moments that you really needed. But you had obviously mum and dad were I know, there. I and... was so out of it on all the medications that honestly, yeah. it's such a blur that time. I only remember snippets of it of certain times when I was, because I was passing in and out because I was in so much pain. So let's talk about that. So it, when you were at your worst, mm. that was um, around the age... When were you in hospital? 11. When it was at age 11 when you so went I was diagnosed in and out of in January. Yeah. I think it was the 6th of January I got diagnosed um, in 1991 and Easter. Remember it was Easter and granddad passed away. That was that was like more towards when you were really ill. Like yeah. it wasn't at your diagnosis. Yeah. My diagnosis was February of yeah. 1991. Yeah. And it took January, February, March, took three months and then just before Easter. So just before Easter is when I was hospitalised Yeah. Um, for a good two months for pain control. And we were in year seven then. Yeah. Yeah, because I remember, and this is what I wrote about in my book as well, is the twin pain is really real because when you were at your worst, I could feel that and I would know that there was something wrong in my guts. And then shortly after that, a teacher would come in and then mm. say, you need to, you need to go to hospital now. You're, you're like, your sister's really sick. Yeah. And so I would always feel that deep connection within you. And um, there's positive connections, but then the, when things are not, not good, but when your twin is not well, it, it, yeah. it's a haunting feeling, isn't it? Yeah, like even now, like if you have bad days, I'm like, I'm, I'm gonna call her. Yeah, you and just then, feel um, it. It feels. And heavy. I just know when we're when you're off or something. Yeah. Yeah. So when you were um, when you were at your lowest, when you felt really, really sick, I remember you flatlined and you died twice. What was that like? Good and bad. So, what was the how the hardest part about? The hardest part was nah. I knew I was putting my family through hell. I knew that it was very hard, especially for mum, because she was, you know, next to my bed 24-7 or most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, and she was absolutely exhausted. And that particular night, when you're in pain for a long period of time, you actually get a bit delusional. Yeah. So I was starting to get delusional. I thought my left shoulder blade was lower than the right, and it was all about, because, you know, I was tiny and, my left shoulder, even to this day, this is the one that clicks the most. Anyway, it, I was like, mom, my, my shoulder's not right. And she was just really tired. And 
yeah, so that night um, I was in a lot of pain and it had gone on for months. So I went a bit cuckoo that night again. Um, so it was exhaustion that it was made it really hard? Yeah, it was exhaustion and mental and physically. I just had nothing left in the tank. I, I, had, I was 19 kilos. I had no muscle on me. I couldn't walk. And it had been going um, on for such a long period of time, every day in pain, yeah. right? Every, yeah, every, there was no seven. break. No. no break. No, there was one time that mum got like a million face washes and got them all really hot and put them all over my body. And I think I got 30 seconds of relief and it was like, and then that was it. So, yeah. And so what, how do you deal with every day? Because I'm the point of um, talking about these conversations is to talk about, yeah. you know, that we all have those days, some of them are worse than others, but where we really feel like we cannot put another foot in one of the, in front of the other, where we just don't feel like we can go on. Because my next question is, what does resilience mean to you? What, is, what does it mean to be resilient? Well, I'll answer that in two ways. I remember mum back in when it was really bad, she would say, Nicole, sometimes it's a day at a time. Right now, it can be a minute at a time or a second at a time. Just take it a second at a time. And she was right. Um, as a child, I think you do what you have to do. You bounce back quicker. As an adult, answering that question would be a bit different, but I certainly gained the core resilience that I needed as a child being really ill, where you just are forced to keep going. You, there's no option of giving up. There's no option of this is it. Um, you know, I always thought this, this, there's got to be more. There's, this, this will pass this is not my life. This, this, there has to be better. And so the inner fight was there. I remember yeah. it always being there. But what did um, it feel like when you flatlined and then you kind of released and, and, and got to that point? I think, um, How did you would have, you, you would have thought that it would have completely frightened me and, and, and it would have been a horrific experience. In fact, the opposite, it was, um, a very spiritual experience. Um, there's no human word to describe it, but it was um, peace. I wasn't in pain. I was light as a feather. Um, I probably was out of my body. I don't know. Um, but why, why do you think it got to a point where you just surrendered? Um, was it a conscious thing? Was it I a... think, yeah, no, it was. I remember a moment where I was just, can't do this anymore. And it was the first time that I was like, I, I actually can't even take another breath. And then I remember closing my eyes and waking up to mum pounding on my chest saying, don't leave me, don't leave me. And that was when they were trying to also resuscitate me apparently because that's all blurred. But, um, but I do remember that moment of I, I can't breathe anymore. And did, and did you get like any messages? Like did you kind of like get anything where, wherever you went in those moments? Was it like and then... And then what was the decision to come back into your body? And then was there a realisation after that experience? Like, did something change you? Yeah, definitely. I remember, I, I definitely remember being out of my body and possibly looking down because I was very, I was not in my body. I couldn't feel any pain. I felt this complete and utter, there's no word, but really love, peace, tranquility, Relief. Acceptance. Right. No, no, not even relief. Just full acceptance of your soul. I don't know. And then I, look, I probably would have passed over if mum hadn't have really said, I need you to be here. Maybe that, that is why. I don't know. But I remember this you felt mum, I felt like I had to come back yeah, yeah. And, and keep fighting. So mum really did bang me back literally and um and then um yeah of course that got everyone really worried but for me I think it got me to another state of okay death isn't scary so it's okay so it and it created more strength within you yeah it did it really did it gave me 
more substance and understanding of the world a little bit at that young age and more understanding it later Why as well. Why do you but... think you went, what did you learn from all the suffering and pain from having an illness so young? What, what, what do you think if you were, um, if that experience was placed in your life for you to learn something and to elevate and grow, what would that be? That the tiniest little moments matter the most. That mindset is everything you can get through absolutely anything with this. Even pain and illness and yeah. it's like, how is it's it It's amazing mind... what the mind, because you take yourself to another world to cope. It's amazing what the mind does to get you through. Mm. Um, eventually, as I got stronger, obviously nutrition, exercise and all that contributes yeah. massively. So, but at that time where it was extreme, your yeah. mind. And so when you started to rebuild and you, and you did get better and, and, and so you went and had some experimental treatment in London that dad found mm -hmm. and you were treated with chemotherapy mixed with these antibiotics that were um, targeting tuberculosis, even though you didn't have tuberculosis, but they wanted to give you these drugs to... Um, yeah, yeah, it was... It was it was clarithromycin and wifibutin, two hardcore, hardcore antibiotics um, um, mixed with a bit of chemotherapy. And, um, yeah, it, the good thing about that was I was able to get off about 80 tablets a day that I was on currently at that, that time that were killing me. And that was me. pretty slow. What else? That were, what were you on before that? Like 100 milligrams plus a day of prednisolone, cortisone. Um, oh, my God. It's like. I can't even remember all the names, but there was so but, but many. The drugs that puffed you up and gave you that moon face. Pretty slow. And you lost your hair and you were, um, and you had extra hair on your body. No, no. I yeah. had a full moan and my hair and my arms were really, really. Yeah. And we, and yeah. you could only wear really thin clothing because of your arthritis. And yeah, I had to wear very thin. I had from Target, I had my high top sneakers and my, um, really loose leggings yeah. and really light light tops because even yeah. a sheet on me was painful and so and and then i was you know sort of growing into a teenage body and i had boobs and braces what i say in my book <laughs> yes and um i've lost you there where's the video sorry then? my battery's dying um have you got a plug i do but like my earphones are on this do you reckon it's okay if i take out the earphones um let's just see how we go try and keep them in okay Let's just, yeah. And, um, and so I remember you um, had the experimental treatment. You were supposed to be mm -hmm. in London for two weeks. You ended up being there for six weeks. And yeah. I, I, that was hard. That was hard, I, I know. obviously, for you because you were going through all the treatment as well. Yeah, but I really wanted to talk to you. And I remember whenever the phone would ring in the hallway in the, um, in the um, place that I was staying, which was a, a yeah, little... Yeah, and it wasn't easy i wasn't no. able to talk to you as much as i wanted to either and i know that was a dramatic change in our life and i remember being without you and then changing schools and the same year. Oh, and then not only did i lose that sort of connection within the home and then with you and mom because you were gone um uh then i just lost my friends at school and had to start mm. a whole new school and it just yeah. razzled me yeah uh, and so what does it mean to be resilient to you? What does that mean? What's the definition? Resilience to me now means um, my journey of being sick and looking a certain way and my body not doing what I want it to do and not being in control of my body is having um, complete and utter, how do I explain? Basically, you, so you have to be so comfortable in your skin as well as in your soul. You need to be so self-assured that you on your own can get through anything. Um, and you prove that to yourself through adversities in your life and the outcomes and, and persevere and show up and keep going every day. Um, you've just got to keep going. And then if you put yourself in the right positions and places, the right people come. But resilience is all about self utter love for you. If yes. you don't love yourself, no one else can love you. And plus no one wants to be around you. So you just need to yeah. have complete and so it's finding self confidence. That, yeah. That self love and that inner love. confidence and consistency so that no matter yeah. what change is going on externally, mm. whether it's illness or change in life or a change of direction, you, yeah. you find that inner 
belief and sturdiness, I call yeah. it, you know, like the inner anchor, yeah. which allows us to be flexible and more open to change. And then we can see things from a higher perspective um, mm-hmm. and we can have a higher understanding of why things are going on in our life so that we can mm-hmm. feel like things are happening for us, not to us. Yeah. And so as you rebuild your life, um, emotionally, physically, biochemically, nutritionally, like what did you do and what helped you to put to, to rebuild. Uh, so you came home, you did get better. The treatment worked really well, but there was still years, a rebuild. Um, but there was still a lot to do. Um, it was only um, when, well, actually you, you started working at Chase's and doing bar work with all our friends. And I remember your boss, Beck, calling me at midnight and said, Nicole, you're coming to work. <laughs> and I hadn't been out in the world in so long let alone in a nightclub. And I don't know what possessed me, but I got dressed and I hadn't left the house in like, you know, a year and a half, literally. And I went down to Chase's and she interviewed me and she goes, you start right now, get behind the bar. And I said, Beck, what if I need to go to the toilet? Like, cause I had to go to the toilet all the time. If I needed yeah. to go, I had to go to the bike then. Yeah. And she said, I'm right here. And she really changed what you believed is possible, what, I, yeah, what you exactly. believed you could do. And it was and so then, much fun. We ended up working in the bar sometimes together. Best upstairs, days of our lives. Oh my best God. days of our lives. It was awesome. That was meant to be. That was meant to be. I know, I know. But it was when we decided, we went to uni and did our thing, but it's when we, I decided I wanted to do full-time dancing and singing because that was our passion. I thought, while my body's good, I'm going to do this. And when we started exercising on that level and scale as a professional dancer doing jazz, hip hop, ballet, rah, rah, yeah. um, you know, full time. God, we were so sore for the first week, but my whole body changed. The pain started to subside. The, my bowels started to work more normally and and we had to eat well, really as well. And we had to eat really well. Yeah, as well. to yeah. stay fit. And it also, you know, <laughs> experiencing adversity helps you to understand what's important, which we're all going through right now. We're minimalizing, mm. we're, yeah. we're stripping things back, we're realizing just connection and yeah. having those for you people in your life that really matter to have moments to laugh. And what we realized then was like, I love to sing and dance and I yeah. want to actually give this a go as a career now that we're 18 and yeah. 19, I think it was. And so, yeah, it helps you to, you know, strive for your dreams. And yes, yeah. I do remember that. That was, that was, it was pivotal. a pivotal point. Huh, pivotal. And yeah, it was a it was a pivotal point. Um, and in it my forced us to really do what we wanted to do, and then and yeah. then you launched yourself into um, the beauty industry. And I think you learned you went through a lot when we looked different, and you were on medication, and I started growing. And you know, I, I hated that too. I hated not looking the same anymore because we're so used to looking exactly the same. We're identical twins. And so, how did um, the gift of um, learning? Because you became obsessed about how to, it wasn't just about beauty. It was no more an inside out connection of beauty and, and changing the external and how that makes you feel on the inside. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I thought if I'm going to be sick, I might as well try and be the best I can be on the outside doing so, because if yeah. I can't control my insides, I'm going to control my outside. But, uh, yeah. Well, there you go. That's exactly what was going on. And then you um, became a makeup artist and you had your beauty salon and all your clients have always just loved you, that connection. And it was wonderful. Loved it. <laughs> you loved that and helping people to feel better about themselves. It was always about that. and Deep conversations um, really during, you know, the beauty therapy stuff. It was beautiful. And then you went through another hard time when you had a bit of a, a change in your business, didn't you, where your mm. beauty salon um just took a turn um i think you had a break didn't you and then it caused yeah, the sales I closed to drop down. yeah i closed down and i mo- um when i came back i moved shortly afterwards across the road and that deeply affected for some reason um things my change client, yeah, yeah and it was really 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 hard but i showed up every day i didn't just pop in when a client booked in and maybe I was you there. already had that skill set because of what you went through when you're younger you had the yeah. discipline to still yeah. put one foot in front of another and when you're sick with an illness you, you kind of have no choice, do you? It's not like a choice. It's not a no, choice. It's like you it's have no choice. choice but to keep going because they're kind of like bodily stuff that you're dealing with. Otherwise, you're not going to survive. And that mm. is a gift, isn't it? Yeah. 
how has that translated into what you had to go through then with the business and how you had to rebuild it and create Hugely. me and browse like you have now? Well, I realized um, after a period of time that what I do, was doing was not working, even though I was showing up, it wasn't working. So I had yeah. to put myself out of my comfort zone and think, okay, what's something I still love to do that's within this that I can upskill on and create? Hence, I um, fell into cosmetic tattoo artistry of the brows because I had mine undone because I ruined my eyebrows in year nine with chicken pox. So I had experienced someone working on my brows and fixing them. And um, when microblading started becoming a thing, I looked into it and training for that was a challenge. And, you know, you're cutting people's skin. It's not just a whack. So this is a whole new ball game. And, um, but I thought, no, I'm going to do this because I love it. And I loved working on people's faces and creating a natural, natural look on someone that completely makes them feel more comfortable with themselves. So it wasn't just like a makeup transformation or a beauty transformation. It was, it was real transformation on their face straight away that lasts for a long period of time. So that was a huge journey and, and, and hard, but very rewarding, very rewarding. And then the growth of, of me and Browse was just incredible over the first, well, it's been four and a half, almost five years now. And it's just gotten bigger and bigger and bigger every year. And, and now I'm on to my next project and that's scary in itself, but I'm like, no, you've got to keep growing. So what's so, your advice with people that have a change in their business? Um, maybe their, their sales have dropped. Um, maybe they've lost their job. Maybe they mm. want to start a new career and really follow their passion and rebuild something new now. What's your advice to, to people like that of what they should think about um, to get through that? Just find something you love. Find something you wake up in the morning, think about and go to bed at night. And if you haven't, don't know what it is, find it you can find it. You can find it because things change all the time on what you're passionate about. And it's through experience that you, which is hard at the moment. I know with um, lockdowns and everything and not going through as many experiences out there, but I find through experience, you find your passions as well. And then find your passion yeah, and then refine the skill. If you, if it, like any top athlete, if you do something over and over and you over it. Yeah. every day, I practiced on my practice pads. My roommate thought I was nuts, but I couldn't move my arm. And I did that daily until I perfected my craft because I knew I had to be the best. And that was no other option. And you can also apply that or not the best to a I technique. Be. It's like, yeah, but it's trying and trying again of of pivoting how you can apply your skill set to create a new business. Like exactly. And how we've all had to go digital. Like I've had to figure out ways of same. you know, seeing clients and, and working with corporates in a totally yeah. digital way. So it's same, but it's totally different. Yeah. And, and it requires so how do we get out of our comfort zone when we're going through so much fear because everything's changing? Like how do we do that? Well, you also need to do a few different things outside of your box that you would normally think of. For example, I love the skincare that I've been using lately. And I decided to become an ambassador only because I love the products, but also it gives me an opportunity to earn some extra income on the side digitally and also speak to my audience, which is still in the beauty field. So it's win, win, win. So I what love saying is you think, you think you've got to think outside of the box. Yeah, of course. You've got to of think outside, out of the box. And then you've, you've got also... to try different things because that might lead on to the next thing that is you what you're supposed to be doing. Things. Yeah. I try and do something that scares me every day because it rewires my brain to do something I normally would say no to. Like yeah, the exactly. thing you put on the very bottom of your to-do list, I, I try and do that first. If I have a list, I do the hardest thing first. Yeah. 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 Because then the rest of the day is easier and, and you bring that satisfaction in achieving. Yeah. There's nothing better. To all your other tasks. Exactly. All right. Cool. So tell me what are um, three tips that um, you can share with everybody today on, you know, overcoming adversity, how to be more resilient and how to be more open to change that we're all experiencing. Know that whatever comes your way, you are equipped mentally and physically to deal with it. Absolutely. Yeah. Trust in yourself, trust in your gut instinct, the core of you, listen to it. And you do that through meditation and stuff. 
But even um, I remember when I've gone through the worst of my um, stuff I've gone through with illness, there is something inside of you, isn't there, that instinctively takes over. And each it's like, person has their own essence. They know what to do. And their own superpower, right? Yeah, that's right. And so believe in yourself. Utterly love yourself. The biggest thing on this planet that you need to learn that everyone needs to learn is to completely and utterly, completely love yourself. How do you do that? I do that by meditating. Mm. I do that by journaling because then I remember all the things that I've, I was even reading <coughs> my old journal and I had to put it down because I was like, oh my gosh, I could read forever because you forget all the things that you've done yeah. and accomplished. And um, journaling is very good with emptying and washing the mind yeah. of like, because you get it out of your head and onto paper and that exactly. closes the tabs you in forget, your head. You forget what you've been through. And also just looking at memories <coughs> sometimes on, on the computer or something. I try to stay off social media too much. I don't scroll. I, I just do post things do. and do things because it just, you get lost. But like sometimes I'll look at memories and I'll be like, oh my God. So that, and also just, just hone a skill that you love to do, that mm. you that makes you smile, that makes you glow, that makes your eyes sparkle, yeah. and really research it. Study Get obsessed it. with it, and and meet Get other people doing it. it. Meet other people yeah. that are really good at surrounding yourself. You become yourself the company you keep. Yeah. And so yeah. keep that group around you yeah. towards what you want to accomplish. And if you have these thoughts or beliefs or ideas that pop into your head of like, nah, I couldn't earn money doing that. Question I it. That Ask the yourself time. why, why, why not? not? Why and it's not? usually an expression of because I don't deserve it or the, yeah. the good yeah. things don't happen to me. Yeah. And that's the juicy stuff that needs transforming. Yeah, it is. It is. But if you go out there and go for what you want, that's another way in of transforming those deeper beliefs that, you know, mm. try it. Good things do happen for you. I can. If you don't do it, someone else will. That's right. And you're more than capable of doing it. Anyone yeah. is. You just have to believe it. So everyone out there who's going through something right now, just really believe that or understand um, that, you know, everything you're going through is getting you ready to become the next version of yourself that you're ready to be that's going to give you all the things that you're asking for. Mm -hmm. So it's happening for you, not to you. And we have to get through the grit, don't we? We have to get through the mm -hmm. sludge to, and the person we become on the other side of that is the point. Yeah. Isn't it? And there are hard days, sit in them. But there's really pass. rewarding days too. But when you get over, when you pass the hard days, yeah, the juicy bits come. Because of the power of polarity, right? Yeah, so exactly. You don't, you don't know, know the light joy. and dark, dark yeah. and light, joy and dark, yeah. So there is, you can absolutely get through anything you're going through. And my tips are, you know, just to add to that is, you know, mm. try and be in the present moment as much as you can, which is probably why journaling and meditation works really yeah. well. Spend alone time, just take, particularly during yeah. this time while we're still waiting to get out of lockdown, try and utilize the time, you know, switch it around in your head, give it a new meaning of, thank God I have the opportunity to slow and rest, maybe read some books I haven't yeah, read yet. It. Exactly. Flip, flip it. the story. Cause it's so easy to yes. go, Oh my God, I'm trapped. I know. And I don't get to see my friends or do these things, but what if there's a higher reason for all of this and just take advantage of that. And then and you take back the control. Yeah. Yeah. And it's all perception, isn't it? Subjective. That's really cool. Thank you so much, Nicole. Now, um, thank you. You, um, not only do you tattoo eyebrows, but you've also got an, an academy starting yeah, I've been working on it for a couple, well, a year and a half now and we'll be launching. I want to teach. I want to teach what I love. So that's what yeah. I'm going to do. So that's so a new that's thing, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And how can people Scary. find you? <laughs> um, well, um, www.meandbrows.com. That's the website. But all our social media. So yeah, M -I 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 sorry, www.meandbrows.com. Amanda will put a link below, I'm sure. Yes. And um, everyone can never pronounce me in brows. And um, yeah, yeah. All the social media links. Um, oh, they'll Instagram be on your website. Facebook. Yeah. Exactly. They show all the updates on what's coming up on the Academy. But yeah, me and brows. Yeah, great. All right. Well, Thanks, thank you Amanda. so much for, um, you know, being my first guest on my vlog. Thanks for having me. <laughs> That's all right. Well, I love you very much. Love you too. All right. See you guys. See you next week. Bye.
please tell me that worked. 